Okay, let's finish off our conversation on energy with oxidative phosphorylation. Um, also known as the electron transport chain, we are simply taking all these IOU notes that we created earlier through glycolysis, through the pyruvate dehydrogenase mechanism, and uh, through the TCA cycle, and we're going to cash them in. And we're going to cash them in for money. And the body's form of money is ATP. So we're taking all these NADH molecules and FADH2 molecules, and we're turning those bad boys into money. So this is pretty, pretty uh, detailed process on how we do this. Um, it's a lot less reactions, and it's a lot more conceptual, and, uh, and I think that's what we're going to cover. So we're going to figure out how, how we cash in these IOU notes that we just created. So um, one thing I do want to point out is, while the TCA cycle and glycolysis and um, the pyruvate dehydrogenase reaction, they all took place in a different, uh, in a different area than oxidative phosphorylation. So the TCA cycle is in the mitochondrial matrix. Glycolysis, like I already said, is in the cytoplasm. And finally, the pyruvate dehydrogenase reaction, pyruvate decarboxylation reaction, that's also going to take place in the mitochondrial matrix. So, where does oxidative phosphorylation, also known as electron transport chain, where does this take place? Well, it's actually going to take place right on the uh, inside of the inner mitochondrial membrane. What the heck does that mean? What is actually the inner mitochondrial membrane? What actually happened to the outer mitochondrial membrane? Well, this kind of goes back to, let's look at the structure of the mitochondria. Kind of an ovaloid looking structure. It's pretty accurate. Uh, not drawn to size as you can tell. Um, so we've got this outer membrane. This is going to encapsulate the whole organelle. So this is going to be the outer membrane. Outer. Let's see if I can get a blue in here. And then it's got all these kind of like folds in it, a little cristae in it, increase the surface area, and that's going to be the inner membrane. So let's draw another arrow. Inner. Inner membrane. So we've got an outer membrane and inner membrane. So that means we've got an inner membrane space, which is the blue X, and let's do red X is the mitochondrial matrix. Mitochondrial matrix, MM. So TCA and pyruvate dehydrogenase occur here. Outside the mitochondria is the cytoplasm of the cell. So the cytoplasm, so this is where glycolysis takes place. But what we're going to be focusing on is the uh, inner membrane. So right inside the inner membrane there is going to be our oxidative phosphorylation. And it involves a whole bunch of complexes that get kind of shoved in there. So we're going to focus right in on the inner membrane layer. I'm going to draw it super magnified here. So, what the heck is this? Okay, so here's our inner membrane space. Remember, the blue X was there. Blue X. So we've got the outer membrane up here. We've got this inner membrane space. We've got our inner membrane. So this is going to be our inner membrane. And then finally, we've got um, our mitochondrial matrix. Our mitochondrial matrix. So this is the, intermem the inner membrane space. Uh, we've got our phospholipid bilayer, um, but mostly, for the most part, it's made up of proteins and these complexes. Uh, so let me draw this over here. Mitochondrial membrane and inner. We'll need all the space we can get. We need all the help we can get, honestly. So here's our inner membrane, here's our space, I'll call it, for time's sake. Space. Okay, so what do we have? We have this inner membrane, and it's got a whole bunch of these complexes in them. So we've got complex one, I'll draw them in blue. We've got complex three, and we've got complex four. I extend it over a little bit, not long enough. And we've got this big black blob that I'll refer to later. 
Don't worry about the black one for now. And also we've got this, oh, how am I going to draw it? Just like that. Kind of this other structure. So we've got this complex one, number three, number four, and this number two is kind of the oddball out. Number one, two, three, and four. So we've got our TCA cycle in here, cranking out all those, you know, NADHs, the FADH2s. So we've got a whole bunch of NADHs going on. I okay, I got cut off here. I got cut off, so I'm going to have to fill in back where I was. We have the NADH that feeds into complex one. So the NADH is going to donate its electrons and to complex one. What that complex one is going to do, it's going to take a hydrogen ion from the mitochondrial matrix here. And it's going to shove it up through the pore, and it's going to stick a hydrogen ion up in the intermembrane space. So we're moving this hydrogen ion into the intermembrane space. FADH2 is going to feed in here. So FADH2 gets fed into complex 2 and gets converted back into FAD. Um, notice here that complex 2 isn't going to shove a hydrogen up, but uh, everything downstream is. So this NADH is going to move a hydrogen up, and what's going to happen is coenzyme Q. Coenzyme Q, C-O-Q, also known as coenzyme Q10, uh, also known as, uh, I think, ubiquitin. Uh, oh, uh, ubiquinone. Sorry, not ubiquitin. That's something else. That's protein. Oh, ubiquinone, also known as coenzyme Q. Uh, that's going to transfer the electrons back over to 3, so coenzyme Q is going to move electrons from 1 to 3, and from 2 to 3, so it's just going to be the mover. And uh, complex 3 is going to do the exact same thing, it's going to move, it's going to use those electrons and reduce them using oxidation and reduction. All of these use oxidation and reduction, the movement of electrons, and move that hydrogen from down here, move it up here. So we're creating a hydrogen gradient. We're putting hydrogen ions all up in one space. And then uh, finally, we're going to move those electrons finally over to the fourth complex, complex four. So we've got complex one, two, three, and now complex four. And that's going to do the exact same thing. It's going to move that hydrogen up here. We're creating a gradient. Uh, so uh, that's very important. We're creating a hydrogen gradient right now. So an NADH molecule is able to move one two, three hydrogen pumps and activate those hydrogen pumps. FADH2, like I've been saying all along, is a less potent IOU note. It's not going to pay out as much. It's only going to move two of these hydrogen pumps. So NADH activates three hydrogen pumps. FADH2 only activates two of the hydrogen pumps. Uh, that's an important concept. Electrons will go from complex one to three or two to three, but it doesn't go from one to two to three to four typically. So what happens once we've created this hydrogen gradient? Then we move over to the black box, ATP synthase. ATP synthase. ATP synthase is a molecule. Uh, it's got an F0 portion, uh, F0 portion, which uh, is, creates pore in the membrane. The F sub 1 unit sticks into the matrix, and it's going to crank, and it's going to create ATP. How does it create ATP? It's going to use this hydrogen gradient, which are going to diffuse down their gradient. I mean, everybody's up here. They want to space themselves out. They'll move down their gradient through this pore, spin a little complex, which creates ATP. It's going to convert ADP to ATP. So ADP to ATP. Important concept. And this is this the gradient, this all this work that we've done comes down to this one molecule of ATP synthase, this, this complex that's going to spin around as these hydrogens flow through. It's going to spin around and it's going to create all this ATP. All these IOU notes get cashed in, money in the bank. So we've got all these redox reactions going on. The final electron carrier. So once we've used up all these electrons, they're kind of going down, 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 down getting more less potent, less potent, less potent. The final uh, acceptor, so once complex four is done with them, 
it's going to be transferred, these electrons are going to be transferred over to uh, oxygen. And that, that'll create H2O, water. So our final electron acceptor test question is oxygen. Uh, the, once electrons get transferred to it, it'll create H2O. Important concept. Um, complex two, importantly, um, we've already seen this before. I know I drew it as a little blob, but complex two is also known as succinate dehydrogenase. Well, you're, you're saying, where have I heard that? That's in the TCA cycle. Succinate dehydrogenase is one of the enzymes in that cycle. And that's actually going to be also uh, complex two in the oxidative phosphorylation chain. So it's going to have a dual purpose. Um, what else can I talk about? Complex four is important because you can inhibit it. Uh, have you ever heard of cyanide poisoning? Or how about carbon monoxide poisoning? Both of those, instead of oxygen being the final receptor, cyanide and carbon monoxide are going to take the place of oxygen. And instead of dumping off their electrons to oxygen, cyanide and carbon monoxide are going to block that transfer. So they're going to sit right here. They're not going to allow complex four to dump their leftover stuff onto oxygen. And it, it's this going to shut down this whole system because you're going to get a backup cyanide and carbon monoxide. Going to knock out complex four, not going to allow the dumping to oxygen. Um, important concept. So uh, let's do a little math here. Uh, Let's do a little math. Like I said, complex one is going to accept the NADH and it's going to pump out three pumps. Uh, FADH2 is only going to pump out two pumps. So we've got FADH2 molecules. Uh, we've got per one molecule of glucose. One molecule of glucose is going to be the key. 1x glucose. Everything we're talking about is dealing with one glucose. We're dealing with one glucose creates two pumps of the TCA cycle because remember through glycolysis we've created two different molecules to create two pyruvates which each get pumped through once. And in the TCA cycle we created two FADHs. So once everything is done, one molecule of glucose spins the TCA cycle twice, giving us two FADHs. NADHs, this one's a little more complicated. Glycolysis will give us one, uh, uh, one molecule of glucose, will give us two molecules of glucose, or NADH, two N, I gotta write this down, two NADH in glycolysis. We get two NADHs through one molecule of glucose in glycolysis. We get two NADH through uh, pyruvate dehydrogenase enzyme. And then finally, we get six NAD per one molecule of glucose uh, through the TCA cycle. Through the TCA cycle. Because um, each crank does three NADHs, and you crank it twice, so you get six. So this is a total of 10 uh, NADHs that we've created so far. Also, we create GTP through each one crank of the TCA cycle. You create one GTP, and you've cranked it twice now, so that's two ATP. You follow me so far? And then, uh, and then finally, uh, now we can cash out. So we've, we've kind of totaled up all of our uh, direct AT making. Oh, oh no, we have it. GTP, oh, let me break this down. Two and two, okay. Two uh, we made through the TCA cycle. And then two we made through glycolysis. I knew I was missing something there. Okay, so we've cashed out everything. We've made two NAD, uh, FADH molecules. We have 10 NAD, and now we have four direct ATP. So let's do some math. All right, so I'd like to wrap this up with, a, uh, with some math. You know, I hate math, but so let's, let's figure out how many ATP we get per one molecule of glucose. And 
th this kind of sums up everything we've been talking about for the last hour or so. Um, so what what can we do? We have four direct ATP. Um, so two from glycolysis and then two from the TCA cycle. Two uh, each gives you four direct ATP that's usable by the body. Like I said, NADH molecules. We already did the math. We figured out we have 10. And each NADH molecule will net three ATP. So three ATP each times 10, 30 ATP. So we have 30 ATP plus the four that we already had directly. What else do we have? Well, we have FADH2. So we already figured out we have two because you crank that TCA cycle twice. We have two FADHs. Each one yields, I should probably have done this the other way. Each one yields two ATP. And since there's two of them, uh, four ATP, you create it. So the big money maker is your NADHs. However, the FADH2s give you just one less ATP, and, but there's a lot less of them. So that gives you four ATP. So let's do the grand total. 30 plus four plus four is 38 ATP per molecule of glucose. And it's important to realize that glycolysis will give you two molecules of pyruvate. So you've got to crank that TCA twice. You've got to do your pyruvate dehydrogenase twice. Um, but once you do all the math, you'll end up with about 38 ATP net yield. You may see 36. Um, it, the science community is kind of at a debate on how much each one of these gives. If it actually cashes in at 3 ATP even, or if it gives decimal numbers per molecule. Um, rounded, it's about 38 ATP, but you may, just as a note, see 36 ATP uh, per one molecule of glucose. So needless to say, glycolysis will give you two ATP unless you can keep pushing it. If you have to do anaerobic uh, metabolism of that pyruvate once you've done with, so you go from glucose to pyruvate, you get two ATP, but if you can keep breaking down that pyruvate into the TCA cycle, into the electric, electron transport chain, you can get so much more, 38. Otherwise, if you have to recycle that pyruvate uh, through anaerobic mechanisms, you don't get nearly as much. And, you know, I'll cover that later, um, but right now, just remember that with aerobic Respiration and metabolism through the TCA cycle, you'll get 38 ATP. Excellent. You know, be sure to uh, be sure to email me if you have any questions or comment below if you enjoyed the presentation. Otherwise, thank you and good luck on any test you may have.